Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our one-on-one -on -one session. Here are our speakers, Editor TBI, Clark Stewart, and Chief Executive All3 Media, Steve Morrison. Thanks, uh, and just, just from the get-go, it's actually Stuart Clark, but I am the editor of TBI, so... Uh, Whichever way it's said. Quite, yeah, with, with, or BTI. Um, I'm joined by Steve Morrison. Um, Steve spent his, uh, his early career at Granada, where he became the chief exec, and then was a movie producer, during which time his credits included My Left Foot and The Field. Uh, now he's chief exec, he's also one of the founders of All3 Media, which since 2003 has become one of the largest independent production and distribution companies out there. Uh, it comprises 20 different companies, with Optimum and Gordon Ramsay's One Potato, Two Potato, the latest to be joining that fold uh, last August, I think. And uh, today, and appropriately, given that we're at NatP, Steve is going to tell us uh, about all three's plans for the US market. Several of the production companies in the All3 family have already set up over here, including Lion, which makes Cash Cab, um, Studio Lambert, which makes Undercover Boss for CBS, and uh, of course there's the US version of teen drama Skins, which is co-produced by Company Pictures. It started on MTV last week with uh, big numbers and uh, an equal amount of controversy, I think it's fair to say. Uh, in the same week, and perhaps with a little less controversy, but also good viewing numbers was live action kid series House of Anubis on Nickelodeon over here, which is produced by Lime Pictures. Um, so before we, before we kind of get into the nitty gritty of the, the plans for the US, uh, Steve, I, I can't not ask you about skins. Anyone who's been online today, seen the news, will, will probably be tuned into the furore that, that that show has created. It's a hard hitting show, and now there's talk of advertisers walking away and so forth. I wonder, with, with a show like that, is, is in a sense, is that a good thing because it needs to be edgy and, and that dramatic? Or I wonder what your take is on the situation. Well, I've only been in America for a short time, but we're working very closely with MTV and we completely support their statement, which is that Skins addresses real world issues in a frank way, but in a responsible way and in a a legally correct way. Um, what is really interesting is to go back to the beginning of how Skin started in Britain. Brian Ellsley, who's the writer and the originator of Skins, had a list of drama projects which he was going to take to broadcasters in Britain. And he showed them to his son, who at the time was a teenager. And he said, Jamie, what do you think of my ideas? And Jamie said, I don't think any of them are relevant. They're absolutely nothing like the real world as we all live it. And so Brian said to Jamie, will you and some of your friends help me write a project, a completely new project, which we'll put to the broadcasters? And our company, Company Pictures, became involved. And the idea, their collaborative idea, became Skins. And indeed, the English version has run for many years, won many British Academy Awards. And ironically, the English version has appeared in America, on BBC America, mm. created no furore, but a lot of five-star reviews. So it's quite puzzling to arrive in America and see what's going on. But I think if the audience just stays with it and we get past the kind of clip attention, into the characters, because it's a comedy drama, and the characters are not only real, but they're full of loves, insecurities, and all the usual complications, but in a more real way and a less artificial way than perhaps we've been used to with teen drama. Thanks, thanks, Steve. You, you can see why I had to ask, given, <laughs> uh, given the, the flow of news. Um, re all three media and the US. Of course, several of the companies have already set up over here and won commissions on broadcasting cable networks. Um, I understand that plans are afoot to, to deepen that presence in, in a broad sense. What can we expect from all three with regards to the US market this year? Well, what happened when we set out to create a group of companies around the world was that one or two of our companies had branch businesses in America already notably Lion, I don't know if you know Lion, who make Cash Cab, 
and they're now producing America Revealed for PBS and they make history detectives. They already had a company in New York. So we decided to have a kind of hybrid model where we would look for American companies that we thought would like to join the group, but also empower the British companies who wanted to start American branch production companies. So obviously the first com American company we bought was Zoo, who make um, Are You Smart in the Fifth Grader, Speeders, and lots of other shows. And the first company that we set up in London and LA simultaneously was Studio Lambert, which obviously became very famous with Undercover Boss. So as you said, the number has grown organically through the arrival of more and more British companies into America. And there are now six, all three companies working here. And this month, the focus has been much more on scripted than non-scripted with the House of Anubis and Skins and also the launch of Shameless, which we haven't produced here, but originated with company pictures uh, in, in the UK. So we're roughly 50-50 scripted and non-scripted within the companies. And I think our idea is to grow the six companies a little bit more and perhaps set up a little bit of a light umbrella, which we might call All3 USA or All3 Media America. And in that regard, we're, we're going to have a couple of people help the companies grow their American business. So, so will all three USA or all three America, is, is that about providing kind of back office legal and logistical support or will, will that have some kind of direct input into production development and pitching or will we still know the individual production brands like Lion or in a few years hence will we be talking about all three USA instead? I think the companies will, will be, still be very visible. We're not setting up an umbrella to compete with them. We're setting up an umbrella to support them. So what the broadcasters will see, they'll still see Stephen Lambert and Eli. They'll still see Pat Llewellyn at Optiman. They'll still see Tony Takabri at Lion. And we've got this, as you mentioned, joint venture company with Gordon Ramsay called One Potato, Two Potato, which is run by Adeline in LA. So the broadcasters will see all these companies with their ideas, but they'll know that however big the show, the delivery of it will be backed and supported by all three media. And it seems that the hiring of Wayne Garvey from BBC Worldwide, and, and of course, when he was at Worldwide, he was kind of widely credited with um, engineering the international rollout of Dancing with the Stars has been yeah. a tremendous success. It seems like that's kind of a, a crucial piece of this puzzle. Can you tell us what his role will, will be in that new structure? Well, typically we're trying to do that appointment in an all three media way rather than a more conventional hierarchical way. So Wayne will be the managing director of international production around the whole world but he will be in LA and New York every month. And again, if you look at how other companies do it, they tend to develop the IP, say in England or Holland or Germany or Australia, and then send it to the US company in LA. We don't do that. The company that originates the show, if they are practically suitable, will go to America to make the show. So Maverick, for example, who invented How to Look Good Naked and now Embarrassing Bodies. If they want to make a show like that in America, they will make that show. So Wayne, because he has a global role rather than just an American role, he will know what the pipeline of formats and ideas and tapes and programs is, and he will bring that fat, fertile pipeline of formats to America. And in reverse, if there are any ideas, say, originated by Zoo, will bring them back to Europe. And then he will be based in London or the US he, he, or he all will, over? He will be ostensibly based in London, but actually I think he'll be a, a perpetual traveler or a wandering minstrel. <laughs> um, why not just hire a, a US president or CEO and, and do it that way? Because I think that would mean that we would be seen as one company. And I think the whole point of all three media is we are a club 
of 20 companies. They are wholly owned or majority owned by all three media, but our management model is that the founders, the entrepreneurs, go on running their companies within the safety of all three media. So if you're in a very integrated company, you might be in the Soviet Union, and if you're on your own as an independent, you might be in the Wild West, but in all three media, you're in Sweden. You get freedom and welfare. Um, and in, in the UK, um, in the UK, all three media has been an aggressive acquirer of companies. That's how the group has been built. And in the US, as you've uh, alluded to, you've acquired Zoo, um, which makes fifth grader. But aside from that, it, it seems that the focus is on organic growth. I guess my question is why, why not replicate what has worked in the UK and internationally and come over here with a checkbook and buy up independent producers of a certain size and do it that way? Well, of course, if I said that here in front of everyone, <laughs> the checkbook would have to double. <laughs> sure. uh, but what we found, with the honourable exception of Zoo, which is an indigenous American company, that we've been so busy with the growth of the originated British material in America and indeed the originating of American material by the British companies in America that we really haven't had the time to do what you've suggested. You know, there's now a big lion company in New York, there's an Optimum in New York, and we've got our companies in LA. And as I said earlier, there are more companies like Company Pictures coming through and no doubt um, Objective and Maverick will be knocking at the door. However, I wouldn't rule out the idea that creative executives or founders of American companies might want to come within our umbrella because we can give them things, a degree of uh, artistic freedom and a share in their own company going forward, which perhaps is not a model that is common in America. But it's not something I'm rushing out to do tomorrow. I think we've got so many companies that we now have to settle in the States and make resident sustainable businesses that we've already got a lot on our plate and will probably increase, we hope, our US business quite dramatically this year already. And then of the 20 companies that are part of the group, um, let, let me press you and ask, which, which ones do you see establishing, establishing themselves in the US that aren't there already? Which particular companies, if I well, can put Well, I think Company Pictures is an obvious one. They will look to start up an LA branch this year. Um, I would have thought Objective, which some of you might know from Peep Show and Darren Brown and The Cube, which has been a big success internationally and in the UK, they uh, have a joint management and one of the creative leaders, Andrew O'Connor, wants to live in LA, whilst the other creative leader, Andrew Newman, lives in London. So we might find the two Andrews sit astride the pond and they run their UK and US company. And I also think that Maverick, who are a terrific female-facing very modern company are the right kind of company to find a place in the States. We've also got a company called North One, who were the original Chrysalis company, you may remember, when we bought them. And that company is famous for reality, but also sports programs and car programs like Fifth Gear and The Gadget Show. And it's quite possible they might reside in the States, but that's not on the immediate agenda. And, and maybe to, maybe to take a, a step back, what, what's, the, what's the rationale for moving more heavily into the US market now? And, and I wonder, do you see it as, do you expect the production companies to be getting commissions and orders from the cable networks or the broadcast networks? Because often I'm writing about companies that are setting up on the East Coast companies coming from the UK to set up on the East Coast, really to tap into the kind of that USK, that burgeoning US cable market. And um, I wonder what your thoughts are. Well, that was the traditional route, and Lion and Optiman are obviously making programs for Discovery, True TV, A&E, 
um, history, uh, those kind of channels, uh, TLC and so on. But I think because of the growth of reality in this country and the center of many channels being in LA, we'll end up with some on each coast, I imagine. To answer your earlier question, I think they should be serving both broadcasters and cable channels and indeed developing digitally online. I think they should be doing all of them because some of our programs are playing on UK networks and the US networks know the programs, know the tapes, know the ratings. And for example, um, Undercover Boss started with a short series of just three hours on Channel 4 and was backed tremendously by CBS and launched brilliantly by that network and they know us very well. Equally, NBC, ABC, which is currently run by an Englishman, <laughs> and Fox, uh, they all know us and know many of our companies because they're very alert to what we're doing. But I think the cable channels, as I heard Nancy DeBook say earlier this morning, are growing, they're spending more, they're commissioning more and more original content and I see that as the broad base of, a, of a, our companies should be cable shows because it's, it's harder in that crowded schedule of the networks to get as many reliable commissions. And also there's a difference between what I would call generic programs which have a perennial place on a channel. It suits their demographics. It just sits comfortably for a long, long time. Some of our shows have been on the air around the world for over 10 years on multi-year contracts on the one hand and novelty programs on the other hand. And you've got to have a great spirit of innovation and ingenuity on the novelty side, but also the capability to make generic programs as well. And that's the balance of a good production business. And I think because of our structure, the 20 companies have 28 creative centers within them because some of these companies are a group of three companies for example in germany we've got an incredible flow of creative ideas and we can bring them to america of course in the uk the regulatory landscape is such that producers can hold on to rights and then in turn exploit secondary and, and ancillary rights and, and windows which has effectively created an enormous independent production and distribution um, sector it's allowed all three media to build such a, a diverse business um, but that isn't the case in the US so when you think about the US market do you expect to be driving revenues simply from production fees or, or do you expect that you can actually retain some of those rights in order to exploit them around the world? Well, I don't believe that the British government really realized how significant a step they were taking when they changed the rights model in the UK. So as you all probably know, a British producer retains the original copyright, the underlying copyright of an idea, and if you like, licenses it or leases it for a, a, a license period, a period of years usually, to a broadcaster or a cable or satellite channel. That means that the producer can follow that IP into secondary and overseas markets, into digital markets uh, in a very vigorous way. And I think that's created the incredible strength, that's underpinned the strength of the British independent production industry. And it's quite remarkable how such a small market of say six to 7% of the world is exporting about half the world's TV formats. Now what I think will happen is we'll begin to see changes in the rights model in the US and we will retain copyright more than has been traditional, particularly if the idea is already out and it's being made and it's being sold in other countries. And I think what will happen is we'll enter into partnerships, what I would call template arrangements with channel groups which will allow us to retain copyright and partner with the broadcasters and so we can go on distributing for the benefit of both parties.
let, let, let me press you on that, Steve. Why would a broadcaster accept an all three media template rewrite when, let's be honest, it's not as if there's not a queue of people pitching to them and so forth. There's not a shortage of options re-content. So, so what's in it for them, I guess? Why, why would you change that situation? Well, a number of reasons. Number one, there's huge competition in the American market. So if a program has already been out, like Undercover Boss or The Cube, and has been very successful in another market, the customer really wants to know they'll get it. And because we already own the format, it just wouldn't make sense for two rival distributors to distribute the English version against the American version. It would have to be coordinated with the new partner in America. So we would have to come to a rights arrangement and a distribution arrangement. Secondly, they know all three media and they know the way we operate. It doesn't mean that we will retain every right in every instance. If the show is originated in America, we would probably have a slightly different arrangement to if it was originated already abroad. But I think what we will see is much greater competition, actually, as we heard this morning, for those of you who are at the cable session, because the cable channels and the networks are competing with more and more channels for more and more original content, I think we will find the rights arrangements will evolve. C can you say to broadcasters that they might be able to share in some of that international upside? Obviously, you've got a tremendous distribution machine. Is that, is that something you can offer? Yes, depending on the circumstance and the bespoke arrangements, we will come to a unique arrangement for each show, or a template will emerge. And uh, of course, it's uh, in, in challenging economic times, which you know, hopefully we're, we're pulling it out of. Um, but funding TV shows has become increasingly problematic and challenging. I wonder, do, do you anticipate deficit financing shows and to what, to what level? Um, if there's a funding gap, will you plug that in order to then take the international rights? Well, fortunately, most reality and factual shows in the US are fully funded, unless they're absolutely huge. And deficit funding really is a scripted or a huge entertainment show issue. And I think we would look at each situation individually. So for example, with Skins, we fully funded the deficit in our partnership with MTV, and we co-produced the show in Canada. If it was a huge deficit on a network, we might not take that position, but we might look to partner it or the deficit with others, like the network itself. So I think, given that we have a distribution organization, which was voted number one by its UK peers, although we're not the biggest by any means, we're an independent, I think we would have to look at each one on its merits. And all three media is an international company, and, and obviously, given that you sit at the top of that, you're in quite a, a unique position in terms of identifying and picking up on, on programming trends. I wonder what you're seeing from the group that might have an impact on, on what would be pitched into the US. Uh, I know, for example, in Germany, the kind of the reconstructed reality or scripted reality genre has really taken off um, and there's been a take on that in the UK as well now. Can, one, can you tell people how these shows work? And I wonder, is that something that might work in the US? Well, what is very interesting if you're sitting and looking at 20 companies who are all operating independently in some senses and collaboratively in other senses, is you, you see these program genre trends or indeed hybrid trends develop often without any conferring between the companies. So in, Amer in, in Germany, we had a development called reconstructed reality, which happened in daytime largely, and then it moved into access prime time. You recall the Germans used to have a lot of court shows in the afternoon, then they went to procedurals, police procedurals, and now they're doing these reconstructed reality shows in which a true story is reconstructed and written by a journalist or a dramatist and is then scripted and acted out by amateur actors. 
So they have a 60 to 70,000 database of amateurs who are in effect cast like themselves in roles similar to themselves. And we are now making seven daily strips of this, which is a thousand episodes a year, all being made by one company, Film Pool, and they're getting 27 to 30% shares. Now that's over there. Over in England, the recent hit has been a show, I don't know if you've heard about it, called The Only Way is Essex, which is about young people in a kind of wannabe crowd of models, club owners, girl band, dating, meeting each other, on the edge of trying to break into the entertainment world. And this became very famous in England, partly because one of the female characters wanted to be vajazzled, which is a kind of cosmetic jewelry application on a certain part of their body. But I don't want to go any, into any more detail than that <laughs> You'll have in to case see the I show. get into a controversy. <laughs> Um, so maybe that will turn up in America as vajazzled. But <laughs> if, 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 you, if you look at the success of Jersey Shore, it is absolutely inevitable to me. And in fact, somebody said this morning, I think it was um, a speaker at the cable session, the USA head, uh, Mr. Wachtell, he said, when Jersey Shore gets to 10 million, that will be the apocalypse meaning he largely does scripted shows, what will that do to the industry? Well, what I think will happen is that we'll begin to see more and more hybrid or reality drama instead of what we would call in England half-hour soaps. So the Jersey Shore model, in our case, in the case of Essex, is more of, we are making more of, if you like, a comedy drama with uh, very performing characters who are in on the act, but it's not scripted. It looks more like a drama, but unlike the German one is not scripted, and the German one looks more raw documentary, but is scripted. So these are different forms of hybrid drama, and I think you will see more of this in the American market, inevitably. And, and Steve, last, last one from, uh, from me, how, how big, a proportion of your business can um, you generate from the US? In one, three, or five years' time, what percentage of revenues do you think will be coming from this market? Well, we would hope, and you, you heard it here, that we can double our business in America in this calendar year, or indeed in our financial year. And the way things are going at the moment, we're on the way to doing that, so modestly, that would be our goal, and that would probably take our America, the percentage of our total business into double figures in America. Got it. Are there any questions from the audience? We've got two minutes, I think. <laughs> yeah, Kate. I recognise Kate. Front row. Second front. Uh, Kate Bolton. That's a hell of a long way you've come to ask me a question. Please. I know. <laughs> All the way from the UK. How are you, Steve? Very well, thank you. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit more about this, um, how you get paid for programming. You talked a little bit about the deficit financing, and you talked about how it's only needed in certain genres and not in other genres. Um, there's a lot more pressure, certainly in the UK, and you may start seeing it here, for actually what you get paid and when you get paid and how you get paid. We're seeing in the UK, you know, Richard Desmond has this idea that if he doesn't like the way it rates, he's not going to pay you. Yeah. So, I mean, do you think there's going to be more pressure on producers about payment, and how is that going to affect how you do business in this market and in the UK, and how does it, will that affect your aspiration to hold on to more rights, which you have talked about a lot? Thank you. Well, actually, it's very, again, the benefit of being in an international group is it's very different country by country. So during the recession, there was a lot of pressure on broadcasters in terms of cash flow, and inevitably, they tried to pass that on to producers. So payment dates got a little bit extended, and we didn't want the value of our company to be reduced. We wanted to help the broadcaster solve their problem, but not export it to us, as it were. Unfortunately, touch wood, so far, we've come through the recession without going backwards, which I think was quite an achievement when the broadcasters were losing about 15 to 20% of their revenue. 
Now we're in a recovery, and I hope it sustains, but it's still a very frail skiff on a stormy sea, but let's hope it sustains. Then obviously we would want uh, payment terms to be good. And in Britain, it varies between cash flowing and paying on delivery. And similarly in America, it varies. And it's different again in Germany and Holland and in New Zealand and Australia. I think that some markets will retain the vast majority of their programs, what you might call their more domestic programs, fully funded. And there'll be a premium band of programs that are deficit funded. And in that, it behoves the producer, who in our case, fortunately, is an international producer with an international distribution arm, all three media international, to fill that gap if we can. And if we can't, we'd have to have find partners to fill it. So I think it, it will be horses for courses. Coming back to your last point, of course, as deficits, if deficits increased, if they increased in certain countries and in certain genres, it would make our rights position stronger because we would have to be finding the money and the broadcaster would be paying the license fee. In some countries, license fees are too small in proportion to the total cost of the program. So we would have to exploit the rights in order to make the sums work. Steve, thank you. I think we, we're starting to run over, so we'll have to wrap that up now. We've got the but red button. We, yeah, we've seen the red light. Thank you very much, Steve. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you very much.